In those early days, the early 1980s, everybody in country music was trying to record crossover songs that would attract the pop music audience. So I thought to myself, do the opposite. Besides, country was the music that I loved and wanted to record. When my producer Harold Shedd, who produced my second album on MCA, wanted to put an orchestra on my new album, I put my foot down. I want to record my kind of country, I insisted. My kind of country is the clear, pure, old-fashioned kind, emotional and gutsy and also sentimental. The songs tell about real human problems, love and heartbreak and loss, in a way that shows you that the singer is no stranger to pain and is tough enough to survive. One person I had to convince was Jimmy Bowen, the record industry legend and president of MCA's Nashville division. When I met with Bowen, I knew I had to get him on my side. I gave him the tape I'd made of the kinds of songs I wanted to record, songs like Merle Haggard's Mama Tried, Dolly Parton's Jolene, and Loretta Lynn's If You're Not Gone Too Long. And he listened to it. I can get great musicians for you, Bowen remembers saying. I can make you sound great. But if you don't know what a woman should say to cause another woman to get up from her house and drive clear across town to sort through kiss posters just to find your record, then you're not going to make it. That's what you've got to be able to do. That's what I wanted to hear. Man, I love a challenge. So I told him, sure, I can do that. He put me in touch with Don Lanier, his artist and repertoire chief, who is nicknamed Dirt, and we started to visit the publishing companies, lots of them, to listen and find the songs that would complete my mission. I had to go back 20 years in the publishing company's catalogs to get the country music I wanted. Bill Carter has suggested that I approach the highly respected Harlan Howard, whom the Nashville media calls Mr. Songwriter. He wrote the classics Heartache by the Number and Pick Me Up on Your Way Down, as well as one of the most haunting country songs of all time, I Fall to Pieces for Patsy Cline. I felt like I was in the presence of royalty when I settled into the big wing-back chair at Harlan's house. Charlie and I sat there quietly as Harlan loaded his tape machine. I listened carefully as he played me a batch of tunes, but I was a little disappointed. They weren't what I expected from Harlan Howard. I said, have you got anything else? And he said, yes. Then he played Somebody Should Leave. Boy, I started tearing up. I got chills all over me. I said, Harlan, can I have that song? He smiled real big and said, do you like it? I love it. Then he said, yep, you can have it. I knew then that Harlan Howard was testing me. If I had liked all those other songs, he would never have played me Somebody Should Leave. Up until then, I was more or less just a singer. I was really totally ignorant about the business. Then I came to realize that the difference between a singer and being an artist could rest on something so simple, though hard to achieve, as my belief in myself. Bowen gave me a very great gift, the right to control my own music, and a great deal of wise advice. And I thank him for both of them. My kind of country helped kick off what the national magazines called the New Traditionalist Movement, a revolution in country music that they credited to Randy Travis, Ricky Skaggs, George Strait, and me. Of course, none of us set out to spawn an entire musical movement. We had just been looking to record good, solid country music, the kind we had grown up with, the kind that ran steadily in our veins. I've always believed that the heart of entertainment is performance, not just producing a studio version of your work. And one of the most important lessons I've learned is that you're never as good as you could be. I've never stopped trying to improve my act, whether it would be my hair and costumes or songs or how my shows are staged. Early on, for instance, I was very insecure. I would try to find nice clothes, but for a long time I couldn't afford them. I put everything I had into looking nice but I just didn't know how. And when I'd go out and sing, I didn't know how to talk to the audience. After my first choreographer, Andre Tyer, watched me sing, the first question he asked was, Why aren't you looking at me? Well, because you make me nervous, I said. You should look at the audience, he told me. Then take your eyes from person to person and go down the rows like a typewriter. That's the way to really reach an audience. Good Lord, that's awfully personal, I said. Well, where do you look, he asked. At the exit signs, I said. 
One of the reasons I looked at the exit signs was to keep from choking up during the delivery of songs like Somebody Should Leave. But I followed Andre's suggestions to the T, and I know it really made a huge difference in my performing. I also began to experiment with stage lighting. Narvel, then still my still guitar player, had a plan to turn off all the stage lights after our last songs on one of our shows. Everyone would leave the stage in total darkness. Then we'd turn up the moody blue lights, and I'd come back on stage to sing my encore song, the Patsy Cline classic, Sweet Dreams. The first night we tried it, I could barely see the exit signs, and I fell right over the top of a speaker monitor. I hit my stomach and shins, ripped my new satin pants, then I crawled over the monitor. Tom Bresh, who had opened the show for me, was sitting on a stool at stage right. I literally went hand over hand up his stool to stand up. He didn't even try to help me up. He just looked down at me with his arms crossed and said, Good show, Reba. Somehow I managed to gracefully hobble out to do Sweet Dreams, and later the band and I laughed for days about our first try at a big production number. I sometimes thought that Charlie felt demeaned by my becoming more successful, getting lots of attention, and making more money than he did. I knew some folks found Charlie distant and difficult to work with. At the time, I preferred to see his aloofness as a natural reserve, his occasional brusqueness with musicians as perfectionism. After all, he wanted things to be just so for us. But as my bus driver, Larry, says, he never had to ask if Charlie was coming to a show with us or not. All he had to do was just look at me. Charlie caused that much tension. And Larry remembers how Charlie would call me a wench right in front of me when he was talking to the band. I tried hard not to let our professional problems affect the personal life we shared and vice versa. But what I had once admired and loved best about Charlie, his protectiveness, now revealed itself as a domineering nature. And it was starting to cause trouble between us. I'm not saying that I was perfect myself. I can recall, for instance, when we were newly married, feeling impatient and hurt by some of Charlie's behavior after an afternoon performance at a rodeo in Louisville, Kentucky. We had agreed to meet back at the trailer, but when he didn't show up, I finally went out to look for him, only to find him having a beer with the other cowboys and shooting the breeze. Maybe I should have been more understanding about his needing time with the guys. Maybe he shouldn't have broken our plans and left me to worry if he was laid up in a hospital somewhere with a broken neck. I do know that when I walked into that bar and spotted him there, my relief at seeing him all right turned into anger, and I came up to him like some crazed gunslinger out of the Old West. He didn't make either one of us look too good in front of his buddies, and I can't blame him for being upset about that. But there was one incident that still stands out in my mind as being pretty unforgivable, sadly showing the spirit of our marriage. Charlie loved to trade. He'd buy something he didn't need and sell something he did just to be trading. I'd come off the road and we'd have a new car. I'd come home a few days later and Charlie'd replace the car with an orange Bronco. Trading was his hobby, and sometimes I think it was an addiction. He enjoyed it, and usually I really didn't mind. But I had one special possession, a gentle sorrel horse named Legs. I was on the road so much that I rarely got to ride him, but I loved to when I got the chance. He wasn't valuable to anyone but me, I thought. One day when I came off a tour, I went out to the barn. Legs was gone. When I asked Charlie about my horse, his answer was brief. I sold him, he said. I was speechless. Why did you sell my horse? I finally choked out, so mad I was almost crying. I got a good buy on him, Charlie said. All Charlie had considered was the deal. He didn't even think that he had to talk to me before selling him. I was upset at losing legs. I would never have parted with him. But what really shocked me and pained me was Charlie's failure to even think of my feelings. 1984 brought me the tremendous honor of being named Female Vocalist of the Year by the Country Music Association, the first of four times I would receive that award. Believe me, it's a tremendous thrill to receive the recognition of your peers. All artists have a certain amount of competitive drive. 
You have to, to keep touring and creating, to see your records fail, yet keep the faith that they'll succeed someday. So it's especially meaningful to receive a sign of your fellow musician's regard. I will always feel grateful for that. I did have one frustration with the awards process itself, though, that stirred up a lot of controversy. My trouble had to do with the way the artist press ceremony was arranged back then. The awards were presented at the Grand Ole Opry House, and afterwards the CMA would have all the winners go upstairs to meet the press. After all the interviews were finished there, we were shuttled to the Opryland Hotel a mile away, where we would meet another bunch of reporters in the ballroom. All this moving around stretched the country music industry's biggest night of the year to 2 a.m. or so, and by then, everyone was exhausted. By contrast, at the Grammys, the American Music Awards, and the Academy of Country Music Awards, each winner talked to reporters backstage immediately after his or her award presentation, and then was permitted to go back, watch the rest of the show, and later attend all the fun activities and parties. Well, in 1985, I suggested through my manager that the CMA do the same thing the other associations did. But tradition doesn't break easily. I repeated my suggestion in 1986 and was told by one CMA spokesperson, you'll go where we tell you to go and do what we tell you to do. You're just lucky to be here. Okay, I said, thank you very much. That year, I was honored with two awards, Female Vocalist of the Year, for the third time, and at the end of the evening, the greatest prize in the world of country music, Entertainer of the Year. I cried with joy, and then I returned to my seat in the audience. When the show was ended, Charlie and I headed out the side door to a waiting limousine. Someone from the CMA rushed up to us saying, Wait a minute, wait a minute, where are you going? You have interviews to do. I told you I wouldn't do any interviews under these circumstances, I said, and then I left the building. I wasn't trying to act like an uppity star, although some in the CMA might have thought so. I'm happy to say that I ended up winning my fourth Female Vocalist of the Year award in 1987. But I'm almost as pleased to say that since then, the CMA has restructured its artist press ceremony to help the artists face the press with all their wits about them all the better to carry the banner of country music. But getting back to the CMA Awards show of 1986, about a week after I was named Entertainer of the Year, I had the most touching surprise, and it came in the middle of the night. I had been on tour and was riding through Atoka, about 18 miles from home, when Larry Jones called me from his driver's seat in the bus. I stumbled sleepily to the front of the bus and peered out the windshield. There on billboards and marquees, even trees, were signs made by my neighbors and friends welcoming me home as Entertainer of the Year. My eyes filled with tears. The local folks had worked hard to make those signs and had made sure the signs stayed up until I came home seven days later. Thank you, all my friends. I had another hit song that year, Whoever's in New England. One that did more to broaden my audience than any other record I'd made so far. Songs like that are called career records, and this one was my first. I never set out to record a crossover record. As I've said, I've always considered myself a country artist and never wanted to abandon my roots. I had simply come to the conclusion that it would be better for me to just do good material, and if it happened to reach across the pop charts, well fine, that would be an unexpected extra. Despite the success we seemed to be having, Charlie and Bill Carter seemed convinced that I had peaked. Their attitude depressed and confused me. But Charlie's lack of enthusiasm for new ideas wasn't the only problem. It seemed like nothing was going right between the two of us, professionally or personally. It was clear that some kind of blow-up was bound to come. 